Thank you for joining. There's about 40 people here. 41. This part's a little tough. I should have planned around uh, having somebody watch the invites. Um, so uh, this evening, we want to talk about a couple things as it relates to false albacore. <laughs> Piling in. Um, let me advance the slide here. I'm going to go. Very sensitive. Great. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so I want to cover a couple things here to kick it off. Um, first, uh, we waited to start at eight o'clock versus seven when we usually do these because I felt like it's summer and most people are probably still outside enjoying the day and stuff. So um, eight o'clock start. I'd be curious at what your feedback might be about that. Uh, most of the time in the winter, I said we start these at seven. Uh, so sort of in the latest Albi news, uh, Albi shootout starts uh, uh, nine one and runs through October 30th. That's Albies north of Cape May. Um, great prizes, Van Stahl, Shimano, St. Croix, Costa, Sims, Grundens, Hoagie, Fish Snacks, Game On, and uh, uh, among others, and then also a Saltwater Edge gift card for the best photo. You can sign up and learn all the details at uh, saltwateredge.com. Uh, let me make sure I've let everybody, and I don't believe anyone's waiting to get in. Um, Oh, okay. There we go. Only one. There we go. Um, so, uh, and then in other Albi news, um, we started the, God darn it. Sorry. This is not the, exactly the system I was used the last time. Um, anyway, latest Albi news, year two of the Albi uh, tagging studies in full swing. Uh, one of our uh, uh, wisdom panel guys here, Ray Jarvis, has tagged a couple already this year. What, Ray? Yep. Yeah. I've tagged a few. Um was this with and, tags or the transducers with um, the uh, aquarium? Uh, these were the spaghetti tags. So I'm doing a trip with the aquarium and Costa on the 23rd, I believe. So um, um, second year of the study, one of the things we did is we placed uh, um, 73 um, transponders last year. That is um, catch and surgery. You can learn all about it at the Guide Association. Um and then the spaghetti tags that Ray and a bunch of other uh, guides are helping us with. Um, but of those 72, three tags, um, six pinged, um, which is a transponder. And then a week later, two weeks later, um, two more picked up at Montauk. So only three of the, I think it was, uh, um, the lower uh, release mortality than striped bass. You know, I think a uh, small study, of course, but um, I think everybody kind of thinks they're more fragile than they might be. No reason not to get them back in the water promptly, but um, good to know. A um, couple other facts that we know is that the last Albi left Montauk on November 14th last year, 24 of them showed up in um, Harker's Island um, less than a week later in the following week. Um, and three have been recaptured as far as a uh, couple off of Jupiter. Florida, Stewart, and then um, a few um, even further south uh, at Key West. So um, a lot of uh, pretty cool information at the Albi project. Another thing we're pursuing, um, combination of the Guide Association and the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers. I applied for a grant from Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Foundation. They, they supported it, and it's going to allow uh, URI to take the NOAA data that comes in from uh, on all species for all states, carve out the Albi and Bonito and uh, produce a, a document, a, a study that'll tell us what the economic value of those two species are. That's important along with the, the tagging data that ASGA is collecting to turn around and make a case to get Atlantic States Marine Fisheries to manage this species going forward. Um, they don't now. So it's exposed. It's not even monitored. So as it relates to commercial or whatever else, um, we just don't know. So it's important that we um, get uh, um, uh, get management for this species. So um, the uh, I don't believe anyone's waiting to get in. Um, OK, um, so that's where we are. Whoops, that's where we are with that. Um, in other Albi news, um, there's a new app available in the last couple of days. Tom. Food I know is on, and he has had a lot to do with it in the last couple of months. It's been a long project, 
But uh, I bring it up because uh, you can get a point in the raffle, the Albi uh, shootout raffle for using Got One. And what Got One does is it uh, it's on your phone. You download an app from gotoneapp.com. Uh, and uh, it'll uh, when you catch a fish, and Todd, I know you've used it already, um, with a voice command or or touch commands, it, you just say, hey, the fish striped bass, false albacore, let's use that example. And, uh, you know, I don't know, 24 inches. And that's all you need to log your catch. And then you're building a log on your on your phone of your uh, personal catches in time. Uh, I don't believe it'll be very long. There'll be a photo feature as well. That's pretty cool. Um, but uh, you learn more about it. It got one. You'll earn a uh, a point in the raffle um, uh, as it relates to the Albi shootout. If you uh, show us a screenshot of a logged catch. Um, so uh, the other thing is they'll take this data with your permission and anonymize it for 15 miles. 15 miles is like from Newport to Block Island or Newport to Watch Hill. If uh, if your buddy said they caught a fish between Newport and Watch Hill, you'd be like, good for you. It's not really useful fishing information, but that's uh, the way this data gets captured. But it's actually very helpful um, to, um, uh, to fisheries managers um, and will help, help with management of all the species you might catch, um, you might uh, start a log on. So uh, go take a look at Got One. Uh, uh, go take a look at the app at gotoneapp.com. Uh, I want to introduce our, our wisdom panel tonight. Um, first up is Ray Jarvis. He's in the red with the red face, <laughs> the red shirt. Um, <laughs> for many days in the water, he's the owner of Salt of the Earth Sport Fishing. He's a member of the Saltwater Guides Association Albi tagging team. And uh, uh, tell us a bit. You you fish out of Westport. Um, you do some offshore um i looked at your uh instagram and you do it a, a lot of uh um family stuff too it seems uh you know taking um local uh families right um father yeah, absolutely. Son, that on your instagram as well <clears throat> yeah i do a little bit of everything uh inshore offshore light tackle fly um you know beginners experts whatever uh i i enjoy doing the family trips because it's kind of like you know getting kids on fish which is producing future anglers, hopefully, and kind of, you know, educating them from the get go on why we're releasing striped bass versus keeping them. And, you know, why we're doing what we're doing, how we approach catching each species that we catch. Uh, so it's pretty fun. I like, I like every aspect of it. Yeah. And I do a little bit of everything, like I said, but. Um, Albies is one of your favorites. Bluefin's one is. of your favorites. Yeah. Getting offshore is one of my favorites. Hardtails in general are, uh, one of my favorites. So, <laughs> um, next one to join us is uh, Devin Donahue of uh, owner of Decathlon Flies. How's that sound? Owner. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> and I, I, I pumped your tires here with the uh, <laughs> yeah. RI works at the saltwater edge is on the track team and they're three time A10 champions. And yeah. uh, he throws the javelin an awful long way. So if you <laughs> yeah. say something yeah, to him, or I'm pretty sure you're going to get plunged in the back at about a hundred <laughs> feet. It's pretty wild. Anyway, a lot of time on the, on the, uh, on the shore surf and fly, right? Devin? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, um, that you don't mind stripers, albies, whatever you're, you're so much, mind, man, dude, I fish for everything that swims, especially on the fly. Like I'll fish for bluegill on a three weight. I'll take the 10 weight out in the surf in the wetsuit at night. Um, I'm really zoned in on the albies right now though. It's hard to resist. Uh, I kind of put the stripers on the back burner for a few weeks until late September, at least. And then I start getting out on the stripers again with the surf rod and the fly rod, too, at night. That's one of my projects right now, too. Great. Um, I got to I got to share this with the audience here. Um, they, they, don't, something from the archives? they don't need to, to <laughs> see it, but it says. Uh, so that's a picture. If you can see it, that's a picture of the West Wall. <laughs> And he's writing me in the morning, says, might be a few minutes late today. They're all over the wall. Haven't <laughs> hooked up yet. And my response was, don't leave fish to find work. So, <laughs> yeah. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like a good boss. Kevin, uh, welcome aboard. Yeah, thank you. Uh, whoops. Gosh, this, sorry, this is so sensitive. I'm, I um, lost access to an easy back and forth button. Um, 
Uh, this is Todd Trions, uh, out of bait on Instagram, and uh, he's a do-it-all kayak fisherman. I, you know, certainly Albies, weak fish, bonito, chub max, stripers, tog, sea bass, fluke. <laughs> That's already this year, right? Yeah, it's been a good year. It's yeah, been a good year, but ready things to... get crazy right about now. The second I know those Albies in the neighborhood, <laughs> I, I kind of stopped thinking about everything else for the next two months. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we only live a couple houses away and uh and he has the convenience of uh you can really walk out your driveway and drag your kayak to battery park and launch it right there and otherwise you do you do move around though you fish other parts of the state right yeah i i, I fish i fish pretty much the entire state you know i do a lot of kayak but i also have uh, access to boats through freedom boat club so i've been spending a lot of time down in south uh, south county shores over the last two weeks and uh it's on it's definitely on from what i've seen Excellent. So, um, so, uh, you know, uh, most everyone on this call is caught in Albie and held in Albie. It's really a muscle. It's built for speed from the Mackle family. Um, and, uh, what we want to do tonight is, uh, God damn, this is frustrating. Um, I'm going to make every th everyone throw up. I apologize. <laughs> uh, anyway, what we want to cover, uh, as it relates to Albies is finding the fish, tackle considerations, rigging tips, some of the important bait fish to think about, favorite lures and flies and tackling tactics uh, and retrieves, uh, rather, I should say. And I'm um, going to ask the panel to chime in as we go. I put together a couple slides to give it some structure, but basically um, we're going to uh, kind of uh, uh, swap around best practices, things like that, what we might have for some opinions. I have a couple surveys for you guys. And, um, and again, you can use the chat um, to ask any questions. Um, so we would describe the uh, Albi as uh, the nomad of the Gulf Stream. And uh, wow, I apologize to everybody. This is very frustrating. Um, so anyway, uh, it's a pretty good uh, satellite shot of the uh, of the domain of the Albi, but also uh, it tends to appear with this close contact to the Gulf Stream. So southern New England, obviously, Harker's Island, North Carolina, and Palm Beach. And sure enough, those Albies that were tagged by the Guide Association last fall and the transponders we used last 14 months. So we're going to start to see them return um, here. They might even already have done so. Um, but uh, uh, Southern uh, New England, Harker's Island and Palm Beach are all places we've had, um, um, you know, activity on the transponder. So it's really, um, um, we're learning a lot about their migration habits. Um, so, you know, when you're trying to find saltwater game fish as a general rule, you're looking for edges. Maybe the more uniform the uh, the um, bottom is, uh, the less likely it is to hold game fish. And with with the other thing, I think you kind of, uh, as a common denominator, looking for is where the game fish you're pursuing has a physical advantage. Now, Albies feed as a wolf pack; they got great eyesight. Those would be two of their prime. Their speed would be a couple of the primary advantages. So you're looking for locations where um, that uh, physical advantage comes into play. And of course you need to find the food. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, what's that? I was saying, absolutely. Yep. Some of the best Albi edges would be deep to shallow. And I, I use this example right here in Newport, um, you know, uh, right here off Castle Hill, a hundred feet offshore, it's 180 feet deep. So we have really deep structure close to shore and that's, um, created some very good albie fishing here locally, but that's one of the common edges for albies, deep to shallow. All those uh, breachways and such have that same scenario. Uh, and then another one might be where fast meets slow. Um, you know, any kind of uh, ripped up water where there's real current, um, you know, their speed and the disruption that causes the bait fish uh, in that situation is another, uh, another uh, location to um, focus your albie efforts. Yeah, and Peter, like in that picture there, they love to run both sides of that wall. Like they'll run up and down. I've, I've been standing on the walls like that, and you'll see them run right along your feet as they're kind of zipping along that cove and out along the wall, and then back down the other side of that. And they'll and come back. They repeat. Sometimes up and in too, right? Uh, yep. Into the breachway, into the ponds. That's yeah, certainly absolutely. South Cape um, breachways and stuff like that. Yeah, you there. see that all over the southern side of the Cape. I mean, pretty much that every every little entrance to an estuary you can guarantee there's going to be fish around there. Yeah, definitely, especially those hard edges. Bait, right? I mean, that's, um, and that's why I think sometimes they'll even run up inside. Um, yeah. 
you know, it's pretty rec- incredible here in Rhode Island. You know, we have Narragansett Bay and Newport, you know, way down here and Providence all the way up here. And they've run all the way up to Providence the last couple of years. And I honestly feel like they just start chewing out offshore and just eat their way all the way to Providence. Yeah. Just a pretty much. That extends that far. It's crazy. Yeah, um, I've seen them up uh, north side of the Braga Bridge a few times. Yeah, that's that's uh, up towards the yeah. yeah, way, way up there. And I mean, the amount of bait that's up there, it makes sense that they go up that far. So, yeah. so another surf, another edge is uh, is the uh, surface. Um, you know, they'll uh, force a bait ball tighter and tighter, drive it towards the surface or drive it against structure and then attack it. Um, just an incredible photo that I like to use. But uh, we have a bit of video uh, later that's a good representation of that situation. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, Birds are a great way to find fish, although um, there's a video we posted on our Instagram today. Um, I'm not sure uh, where we got it, um, but uh, you'll see one bird fly through, maybe dip a wing, maybe put uh, like a, 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 a an idea of maybe I'll go eat something and keep going and, and literally flying over. 100 albies so that's on the instagram and you know if you can't uh you know certainly the surface activity is a great thing to see exciting thing to see but boy um you know even sometimes the birds don't get uh uh you know move on every albie they see that's what that video today showed me you know we see plenty of birds working like this over a focused albie feed or or a tight bait ball but um i was surprised how um uninterested the birds seem to be in that video that was uh, we posted today well peter it's interesting too last weekend when i found benito the birds were just sitting on bait balls there was no surface activity the mm-hmm. birds were just sitting and when you got closer to them you could see the anchovies underneath them so i started vertical jigging and that's how i got the first one to know that they were there and yeah. then as they started to rise up and break on the surface it was obvious but just vertical jigging on those bait balls you find them too mm. they're probably right. below feeding yeah, they were like 15 feet below the bait balls. Just, you know, the bait was thick. The bait was, you know, from surface to about 15, 20 feet down and they were below. They were yeah. on top, but they were eating from below. Yeah, you'll often see that on the fish finder kind of once you start marking bait, you'll see those, you know, I mean, with any species really, but, you know, you'll see those faster dashes around the schools on the sounder itself. Mm. And I think that, you know, you get into areas where you find bait like that and, you don't need to chase after every school of fish that you see come to the surface. You, I do a lot better just blind casting around the area, finding bait balls, working the edges of those. Really agree. And, <laughs> yeah, and, and not yeah. running over fish to, to get to fish, you know? that's yeah. That drives me nuts when I see people zooming all over the place. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Um, you know, I think with the... Um, uh, Mike Laptu is a diving fisherman. He, he, he's a, he, he free dives. And uh, he was in one of the coves uh, near here and was in you know, the Albies that were in there for like the day, the tide. And uh, he got lots of looks at him and he saw six in a squadron or 60. And they might not even have been showing, you know, but he saw it varied in size, but they worked in a, in a coordinated effort. Like you might think of coyotes or wolves working on prey. You know what I mean? It's not, there's no wasted effort, but they use as a, as a squad, to go uh, cause an effect and then create their opportunity where their physical advantage takes over. The other thing was they've done stomach samples as it relates to the water column, Todd, and they've had their situations where Albies have had, you know, bottom baits, you know, like choggies and whatever. I, I don't know what Ooh. that is, but, you know, stuff that you eat literally off the bottom, you know, Ooh. in their stuff. So it's not all up the water column and your, your idea of vertical jigging, you know, um, under a bait ball makes a lot of sense. Um, so tackle considerations, and this is wide open for everybody um, here. You know, uh, I, my attitude is you need to cast all day. So I try to keep it light. You know, there's some, um, uh, there's a couple of rods, but I particularly like um, that E6X from from Loomis. And then um, the real fast retrieve rate. So on, on spin for me, it's... Uh, you know, the VR50 or the, the twin power or the Stratic, all those. Um, the fish itself is 30% faster than the bonefish. And, um, you know, you got to be ready for real to handle long runs and then just as fast pick up line because when the Albi turns and burns back to the boat, um, you'll the benefit of both a fast startup on the outbound and a fast retrieve 
uh, when it's uh, turning and coming your way. And sometimes fast retrieve is helpful um, in the act of like presenting the lure. But um, and we'll leave this monofluoro debate for a second. But you guys have any thoughts on 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 tackle? Um, I get a you know I, I like a fast retrieve on a reel when we're fishing for albies. Uh, I get a lot of clients that you know a fish is taking line and all of a sudden it stops and they're like oh I lost it. But I'm like real 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 and often you know that fish is still there. It's just like you said change directions, come back at the boat just as fast as it ran from the boat. Yep. Um, so you know a lightweight setup if you're throwing spin all day ideal but a, definitely a fast retrieve and as far as fluoro i'm fishing braid light braid but my fluoro yeah, we'll leaders are 15 to 20 pounds we'll leave that one for a minute that'll be oh, a yeah. discussion <laughs> that one gets not heated but you know <laughs> <laughs> but um uh, how about the rod length seven foot seven and a half eight well, what do you have any thoughts on that ray uh seven foot medium fast that's kind of my go-to inshore setup anyways but um, you know, throwing epoxies like a Joe bags, epoxy or a hoagie epoxy. Um, you can throw those things a mile and I just like a medium fast setup so I can kind of feel what's going on, but still create a little bit of action and, uh, still have plenty of backbone for when I do get tight. Sure. Yeah. Todd, for you on a kayak, uh, any consideration yeah. on length that what's the, how do you, how do you approach that? Uh, on, on kayak, I'm seven foot across the board, you know, medium fast, same, same that Ray said. Uh, love the Stratix. You know, I, I tend not to take my more expensive stuff like the Stella on the kayak, just because I yeah. never want to lose it, right? But on the boat, on the boat, I'm I'm running a Stella with a with a custom Albi pole from Crafty One, um, and then I I have an, a Chris Abbott rod, an eight foot, um, that yeah. I'm using to throw the unweighted Albi snacks around, right? So I always have two rods ready to go, or one slinger. with epoxy and Here's one with a one with a with a with a soft plastic like an Albi snack in case they're close to the boat because. You know, when they're real close, you can flip the Albi snack real close and get it there in, in close proximity without over firing an epoxy at them. Sure. Sure. Hey, Devin, from a fly perspective, and yeah. I know you fish both, but why don't you cover fly? What are you, you know, shorebound fly guy? What are you, what are you fishing in that situation? I think on just a nine foot, nine or 10 weight rod, um, the 10 is nice in the wind. Um, the heavier line can cut through the wind a bit better. Um, some of the light swing weight, man, it, it definitely pays to, get a little bit nicer rod with a better blank because you're going to be casting a lot and it's going to test your casting efficiency. Um, you want to throw tight loops. Um, it'll just make it easier. And I mean, you're just dumping 90 to hundred feet of line every cast um, with some type of, I know we'll talk about fly lines later, but some type of, you know, softball on a string, as I've heard you guys call it, like just like a 30 foot shooting head. Um, it's kind of the standard for spinning from shore. I think like a seven, six or an eight foot rod is kind of the sweet spot. You kind of trade off casting distance for like, handiness when you're going on the rocks and trying to land them a shorter rod is a bit nicer to you know get to the fish and grab the leader um but you're going to trade off some cast distance and just like a three or four thousand size reel with 20 pounds super slick any really eight strand braid i think is just perfect yeah the uh the other comment on the um on the alby on on fly anyway is uh when i'm in a boat i prefer 10 um for the lifting power yeah you know, uh it can you can get tied up with a, with a unable to, you know, it's harder to lift a fish with lighter rods. So I like mm -hmm. a 10 backbone to, to lift a fish in that situation. Yeah. Definitely um, a stripping basket too. We're going to talk about that later. Yeah. So definitely a good stripping basket. Yeah. The, uh, the idea of casting all day, you have to make, so you have to, you know, the shore guy, that's going to be the job. So yeah. um, they, they only come by occasionally. So making sure you're in them when that happens is, uh, is the key. And I know we got a couple very good, um, shore fly guys on this call. Um, so, uh, I think it's probably a, a, um, common, um, you know, everyone sort of recognizes it. And, and I would also agree, uh, Devin, kind of what you said about how it requires the most, uh, of your efficiency. You got to do your best to deliver consistent distance, which is mechanics, mm -hmm. but then also they're just as likely to hop around, hop up, um, you know, you throw a nice 70 foot cast that way and they're going to hop up 20 feet that way. Yeah, exactly. You want to talk fly lines let, yet or, or wait a little bit? Cause I could, you want to talk <laughs> about fly lines though? Yeah, we'll leave it. We'll leave it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll wait. But the, um, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's just, uh, how it is. It's almost like the best, uh, lure fly you have is the turning to, as soon as you've done something over here, they're going to pop up over there and that's how you get them to come up is to 
do something. Anyway, um, talking a bit about mono and fluoro, anybody have any strong feelings about why they would use mono or what is the reason you use fluoro? Ray, what do you do most of the time? Um, I'm fluoro. I don't use any mono anytime, any place. Um, for stripers and everything? For everything, yeah. Um, fluoro, I just, you know, it's got, you know, it, uh, as long as I give it a good stretch, pretty much no memory in it. Yep. And it's going to be a little bit harder for them to see, a more abrasion resistant, um, and in general, just easier to work with. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for Albies, I'm fishing like anywhere from a 12 if they're super finicky, but generally like a 15 to a 20 pound. Um, you know, for clients, I'm fishing 20 pound just so they can hold on to fish more. But uh, personally, if I'm fishing my super light setups, I'll fish like 12 or 15. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that's, that I hear commonly, and I think abrasion resistance is a reason to choose fluoro. Yeah, um, absolutely. The, uh, yeah. And it was interesting. People say fluoro doesn't stretch and actually uh, it, it stretches once and doesn't recover very much. So like you, you, your point about stretching the fluoro at the outset is important because that sets the thing and you only have a little bit of sponge left in it. Whereas, whereas, yeah. uh, whereas, uh, Mono has uh, a more elax elastic situation where it's going to give and recover most of it. It's a spongy thing that is why they use it in offshore rigging, you know, because of the shock absorber. But um, how, yeah. how about you, Todd? Yeah, same. I, I use fluoro for everything. You know, stripers, I'm 60 pound, and then when I'm working with Albies, anywhere from, from 12 to 15, typically 20 is where I usually, and most of my rods have 20 on it. But if they start to get a little bit more finicky, I'll drop down to 12 or 15. Yep. Um, and, uh, Devin, how about you? Yeah. For a spin setup, uh, if I can get away with 20, that that's going to be my first option. If it's like a, like a bluebird sky day with like a light swell, I'll probably go down to like 15 or 12. Yeah. Um, for a fly leader, I actually like to do, um, I have the butt section mono and then the very end, like the last three feet will be, um, like 20 pound fluoro. I just like the mono, especially like the, the Rio hard mono. It's really thick and stiff. So I think I just get a better loop with it and it dumps more of that energy um, into the fly, into the cast. Yeah, yeah. The um, Plus, I would think the heavier, um, um, you know, 20 pound for you would make a difference because you have to go get the fish and lift yeah. it. You know what I mean? It, <laughs> uh, a lighter tip, it would be, would be tougher, you know? Yeah. Um, why don't you speak for a fly lines uh, for a quick sec? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think if you're going to get one, you can't go wrong with full intermediate. Um, there's something to be said. I know, Peter, you've talked about this too, for a intermediate tip line. So floating running line and then like 30 feet of intermediate and you can aerialize it really fast. So, so if you have a pod coming and you present to them and they miss it and they're 20 feet to your left, you can aerialize that, give it a roll cast, get it back as a back cast and then deliver it again way faster than you could if you dredged an intermediate and the same thing with sinking lines um sometimes you might need to use a sinking line um but it, it's a very once you cast 100 feet of a sinking line you're committed to that cast and that retrieve you're, you're not going to recast um without stripping in at least 60 feet of it so it's more of a commitment um but i, I think you'd be fine you could even do a full float or two but i'm usually using a full intermediate and mm -hmm. i think a, a intermediate sink tip's a great idea too so cool. The um, you know, so we've covered the um, the the rod reel setup. We've covered the thoughts on line and leader. I'm supposed to ask you, um, Todd, what do you think about TA clips? <laughs> yeah, I know where that came from. Um, <laughs> you so can that, I like to use them. I use small ones because I like to change things <laughs> up quick. I don't find you know unless it's a really picky day that they really make a difference. I mean, I'm catching dozens in a day, and I got a clip on there, so. If they're going to bite, they're going to bite. I don't think the clip really makes a difference. And it gives you the ease of being able to change things out pretty quickly. You know, what what size clip? The 25? Yeah, 25. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of uh, have a similar feeling. I mean, I um, fish this same clip. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's time to, like, make changes because you can't get a bite, that might be something I drop, you know? <laughs> a lot of people tie direct. <laughs> Um, how about you guys, Ray? I tie direct. Um, if it's a confidence thing for me, I think it's, you know, obviously other people catch them with clips on there or, uh, snap swivels or whatever. I've seen all kinds of stuff, but for me, uh, confidence wise, I like to tie direct, uh, 
you know, if I'm fishing a weightless soft plastic, I'll put a little loop knot on there just so it has a little bit better action. Uh, it's not going to run as rigid and it'll run truer. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm fishing epoxies or, you know, like a little uh, mini Ron Z, those things are deadly when they're picky. Um, you know, I like to tie that without a loop knot and just a slow retrieve on that because it'll run truer. But yeah, for me, tying direct is kind of what I do with everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so you don't use clips on docks and things like that either? I do, but uh, for the most part, I have so many rods rigged up on the boat that, you know, I have a couple dock rods i have a couple smaller plug rods or whatever um so you know honestly more time nine times out of ten i would say i'm tying direct on on those as well yeah okay because i would have thought with all that's going on in a charter boat in a given day um yeah, clip, yeah savior it is yeah, but you, you know too, the, the ta clip on a kayak for me it's in the, like you just don't want to be messing with trying to tie a knot you, you get one shot a lot of times on a kayak you can't get to those fish fast enough so if you need to change out something, it's just, you know, you don't want to be wasting the time tying a knot again on a kayak when you can just pop off a pop off an epoxy, throw in an Albi snack real quick and go, you know? So that's what kind of got me into it. And I've started doing it on boats and it's, you know, I think it's to race point. I mean, either way, right. I think whatever yeah, works, what you feel comfortable with, you know? Absolutely. Devin, what, what knot do you commonly use on the fly line? Um, I, I like a non-slip mono loop. Um, it's it's super simple. You can just look it up how to do it. It's just a little overhand loop and then basically like a two-turn clinch knot. Um, and you can control the size of the loop really easily with just the size of that overhand loop. Um, it's super easy to tie. It's definitely a knot worth knowing whether fly or spin. It's a great yeah. knot. Cool. Great. Um, uh, Peter, the only other thing I'll add is I do use a small swivel sometimes to that TA clip to cut down on line twist because mm -hmm. you get a ton of line twist if you don't have it. So I recommend a small swivel above the clip to cut down on line twist. So they're yeah. okay. So all, both those pieces of hardware at the lure, not the swivel up uh, at the top of the leader. The swivel, the swivel is yeah. What I'm doing is I'm putting the swivel at the end of the fluoro and then yeah. putting the clip through the swivel and then popping the lure onto that. So it's 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 really yeah. the, the swivel is attached to the clip. Yeah, I forgot to ask. What do you guys uh, leader length wise? Is it you know? three, four feet, Ray, something like that? Or you um, some, you almost, know? almost the length of the rod for Albies. Um, I tie a little mini Albright knot from my braid to my fluoro. So yep. it goes for the guides easy, but you know, basically the length of the rod is kind of my go-to leader length. Um, I, I'm making conscious effort to, with my spin to maintain the leader and keep it long. You know, that's part of what, yeah. you know, cause you stop sweat, you know, uh, swapping, uh, chopping the leader down while you're during the course of the day, you know, That's a good point. Yeah. So let's launch this poll, um, and, uh, ask you guys, the rest of you, uh, what lure do you go to first? Damn, man. Epoxy jig. <laughs> man. A bit of a route. Yeah, so um, the reason I put swimming plug, I'm thinking of a small SP minnow or something like that. Yeah. A lot of people, um, I like that really small. It's like a 13, I think it is. Um, yeah. One of the other lures when I'm jammed up, I might try. Um, thing, Little Island X. These guys here have been real hot on the vineyard. Uh, the Which one is that? <laughs> That's an Island X. A little small yeah. Island X. Yeah. That's been hot. Yeah, I have a white one right here. Yeah. <laughs> So everyone needs to come clean on this island. <laughs> See, yeah. I don't think I, I'm there out there in the shop, but uh, what is it? Oh, it used to be called, the, they used to be called the Grey Lady, right? Isn't that what they were called before? That's something like that. Yeah. One of my yeah. clients introduced me to them and I, I started fishing them and I was like, uh, all right, these things are yeah. deadly. And they've yeah, got little, uh, little weights inside of them. So they're, you know, even it's plastic, these things, you can huck yeah. these things a long way. Oh, is yeah. this the manual version? No, this that's one's, this one's an anchovy, and then I got a, a pink one. It's more like a squid. Hey, Kevin, is that the thing that came in with the blade on the back? A couple. Uh, yeah, I, I may have. Uh, oh yeah. no way! I, I had to grab one. Yeah, it's got a little like willow blade on it, and it's I just like, like a stick bait. It's yeah, called a little, um, more, a little more flash. Stinger stinger minnow from Island X. It's pretty cool. Nice. I just I just grabbed it's. I brought it home, so I haven't done anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I did too. That I, I would have mentioned is this monster shot, which is a which yeah. probably pretty similar to the Island X that I saw now that I realize Devin and I are talking about the same thing. Um but the uh 
the monster shots of Yuzuri, and it comes in like three or four sizes, but boy, uh, yeah. it's a heavy duty um, jig. It absolutely flies. Um, so for covering water, another good option. Um, but uh, yeah, interesting. I mean, you know, uh, um, plenty of options for um, for lures and jigs and all of that, but it um, pretty consistent um, um, uh, people getting behind the uh, the um, the uh, epoxy jig and its various things. Um, yeah. yeah, so the SB, one of the bone jumping minnow can be great. I agree with that. Corey used to love fishing that thing. I'm sure he still loves fishing that thing. He just doesn't guide every day anymore. Um, the, uh, um, so, um, yeah, bone jumping minnow. And then the SP, as I described, the small, the smallest of them, um, is a nice, uh, lure sometimes to mix it up. Yeah. Um, I know there's a bunch of fly guys on here, so let's run this other, this other one, uh, pretty quick. Um, how do I get to the other pole? Might be here. Yeah. All right. Might be too hard. Um, yeah, shit. All right. There's that. Um, for, um, for uh fly leader length too. I meant to say something about that. I'm usually between like seven and nine feet. Yep. Around there. The, um, yeah. So we covered the, uh, thank you. So we covered the, um, the rigging, um let's uh come on go away um so let's uh talk a little bit about baits um you know um not all bait is created equal you know some baits school tighter than others you know like bay anchovies and peanut bunker are tight schooling and that albi feeding behavior of really you know creating a bait ball and swirling around it and slashing through it um works uh very effectively against those kinds of bait um, there's other baits that are around a ton right now, less so the sand eels, but the silver sides are everywhere. Yeah. And uh, it's a loose bait, you know, often more in the middle of the water column as well. And it's less likely to create a sustained feed. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, people see the bait and then see albies, you know, here and there and, and just to, and consider them to be picky when it's not really that. I think sometimes it's dictated by the kind of bait that's available that day. You know, beggars can't be choosers, but do you guys have any? thoughts uh, on bait and you know uh what you've seen for behavior with different baits anything any observations of that sort um right off the bat i would say when they're on loose bait like uh silver sides it's more about working those edges rather than working the bait um so kind of understanding where those silver sides are hanging out where those albies are coming from you know how they're running in and feeding and mm -hmm. running out and just kind of you know working the structure rather than the bait which you know is there and if you know the fish are there, you're just kind of focusing on where they're feeding. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like you said, when stuff's balled up a little bit tighter, um, you know, you're going to see fish, fish on the surface. But even if you don't, they're basically working their way around those tight balls of bait. And they're going to come in and take shots, go out, come back in, take shots, go out. So, you're, again, you're kind of fishing around the bait. around, And your bait essentially becomes your structure. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's cool. Because the loose bait uh, um, is um, um, uh, can be, create this less focused feed. But your point is, there uh, if the bait's abundant in an area, it might be loose, but they'll be working through it. Um, right, not as focused an effort. Yeah, they're focused on the area. They're fo they're not necessarily focused on a bait ball. Yeah, um, they're just kind of working in, feeding, going out, coming back in, feeding, going out. And I, then, you pretty, know, uh, on the other hand, they're they're work, doing the same exact thing, but your bait is your structure. Yeah, yeah I have a pretty good example from uh, a year or two ago. Um, and uh, we made this long run of a bunch of hot spots uh, in South County. And we're approaching one of the breachways like, look, after, at this point, we're turning around. Haven't seen a swirl or a bird. And there was a little hump um, not far offshore. And if you didn't really see, you saw swirls and you never really saw an albie, you know, pop out of the water, but went over there to investigate and that's where they were. And there was bait, you know, it was silver sides on that structure around it, you know, and it's just enough of a speed bump to stop the bait from moving down the beach. And the albies found them and that was it. It wasn't a big free-for-all thing. It right. was pretty. 
How about you guys? Any other observations? I mean, you must have some from the wall there, um, you know, confined to hard ground. Uh, yeah. Any, any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I would definitely think to really consider what the bait is trying to do as well, right? So if they're plankton feeders, those plankton are in the first two, three feet of water, especially the, this photosynthetic plankton. So take the South County, for example, all the plankton and all the bait just gets dumped out of all the estuaries. So if we're getting a, a stiff wind out of the West, all of that is just gonna get blown right into the first hard structure that it finds, you know, which could be, you know, the wall of a breachway, which could be, you know, some type of rip. Um, oftentimes it is, you know, the wall. So just consider the effect that wind has on the whole cycle. Yep. Todd, any observations for you? I know you, um, yeah. spot I've heard mentioned, I know I've seen you there. <laughs> you're, you're right. I've seen, oh. This week, this week, it's been all about these guys. I've been seeing a lot of schools of these bay yep. anchovies out front in the Harbor, um, down South County. Um, what's interesting is that I've come up upon big schools and there just hasn't been predators on them yet. I think the fish are still moving in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we waited on some schools yesterday morning before the fog rolled in and it was all stripers on, you know, but uh, it, later on in the day, I know guys were there getting albies. So it's just a matter of the schools finding the bait. The good news is there's tons of bait around, you know, yeah. out front off the drive. I've seen it in yeah. the Harbor. I've seen it down in South County. Um, you know, when I first came across the bait, you know, I waited, I waited, the dolphins showed up, you know, when the dolphins showed up, I'm out of there. Cause I know the dolphins are after the same thing I'm after. Mm -hmm. uh, but I moved a little bit further down South and then found them. And that's, that's where the, the hardtails were. So. The, um, sorry, just making myself a note for later. There we go. Um, well, actually, so I, you know, this idea that, uh, the, the, the different baits produce, um, you know, different types of feeding. Um, I think this next one's the video. Um, nope. <laughs> nope. There you go, Todd. This is an old picture. Um, but, uh, yeah, same thing. That things can be a curse, you know. Uh, so how about that? Um, what's what's the solve you guys have when the bait's so small? You just want to, you know, throw your gear in the water. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah <laughs> imitations. A little going, going uh, small. Right there, Devin. Yeah, do a little snot bait fly. Got to have them. There. I mean, sometimes you literally have to have them. You know. <laughs> right. They won't touch anything else. Yeah. The, 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 um, peanuts, the peanut snack or yeah. I start tying on a hoagie fly, you know, like something else. Right. And yeah. then what else, then, then what ends up happening is you get hit on both and it get, it blows up, but you know, yeah. it's all right. You, you'll use the, use the uh, lure to throw the, um, the, the teaser, the fly. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll tie a teaser like three foot up from an epoxy jig and just bomb it out there. And you know, the, the, the teaser is what they typically will hit. Yeah. 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 Fishing teasers is definitely a good way to go. Um, yeah done that a lot and you know even when they're they're on small bait like that i think just kind of keep throwing in there and kind of presenting it um you know whether it's a tiny little i got like a quarter ounce joe bags epoxy here mm -hmm. tiny tiny one and then a little tiny hoagie one as well mm -hmm. and just getting those in there and uh presenting them you're gonna get bit eventually so when the bait's tight like the those anchovies we described are the peanuts. Peanuts are all silver, but the anchovies, um, you know, uh, there's a, you know, I think I've, I've found that uh, when there's an awful lot of bait, um, I want to stand out. Um, let me just see what the next slide has on it um, before I start yapping. Um, yeah, okay, so we'll run this uh, slide here if I can. So this is a good example of the of a bait ball. Tough to be an anchovy. But you can see they work it like a uh, like they're peeling. That's a lazy striped bass in the middle, but yeah. they're an onion, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of going out and then coming I, back in, taking shots. And... Ray, what's that? I thought you were saying something. Oh yeah, no. It's, I mean, you know, it, they're kind of going in, taking shots, and then going back out, coming in, doing the same thing, mm -hmm. but working the outer edges definitely. Uh, yeah, whether it's like. It, it, the bottom edges or the top edges or the side mm. edges, it's the edges. Yeah. yeah. And when you work your bait on top of that, you know, so it's kind of skipping off the surface, it looks like an injured one. I think yeah. here you know, that's when it stands out to the albi, right? Because mm -hmm. those other ones are swimming away and yours is flutter on top. They think it's injured and they'll go after it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I definitely have a, with a, when I got a fly, 
uh, or you know, so maybe a lure without much weight. I don't know what that would be, but with a fly, you can you let it settle through the bait and they just smoke it because mm -hmm. it's stunned bait. They're just looking. To eat, they're not going to stop and turn around. You can see they kind of have don't really make sharp turns. They make those kind of tuna turns. Their tail yeah. isn't built for quick maneuvers. Um, but um, you know, it's a coordinated. You can see that. You can see they compress the bait and they slash through it. Um, so it's a very, um, you know, th uh, there's another um, video that I have that I haven't been able to get to play on on these Zoom calls that is uh, the more um, dispersed bait over a larger area. But when you see from a drone, you see there's just plenty of albies there. You know what I mean? Get your fly in the, get your flyer <laughs> lure in the water and don't worry about it. But when there's tons of bait, um, you know, it's tough to uh, stay below or in front of the fray. I mean, obviously in the middle is not the place to be. Um, and it's a good time to throw something that stands out, maybe match the size and uh, and throw something that stands out and, 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 and looks different. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have any thoughts on what you do when the bait's really tight? Um, what, 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 uh, what's your solve for that? You know, so you're, you, 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 you match and you're the billionth piece. You know, and you do something different with the retrieve, or do you mix up color? What do you do there? Kind of try and match a little bit, um, but stand out a little bit as well. So uh, when bait's really tight, I think, uh, you know, common misconception with albies is to cast it out as fast as you can and retrieve it as fast as you can. Um, but mm -hmm. I think, like you just mentioned, casting in there and letting it sit almost like a stunned bait can be deadly. Uh, fishing weightless soft plastics, I do that all the time. And you know, the last thing you want to do is pull it out of that feed because that's where the fish are feeding. So by casting it out there, and ripping it back to the boat, you're not doing yourself any favors. Mm -hmm. Throwing it, throwing it out there and just letting it sit dead on the surface, it's going to get smoked, you know, and it's, it happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, Devin, about retrieves, what do you have any thoughts on that from a fly guy's perspective? I, I think a lot of fly guys retrieve too fast. I, I really do. I, I think one of the only advantages that you have with the fly rod and then a fly line is that you can throw these tiny presentations that can be neutrally buoyant and be super light and they can sit in the strike zone. Cause as soon as you stop reeling an epoxy jig, you're going to, you know, you're going to flutter down out of the zone. So you can fish these flies, flies super slow, man. Instead of the, you can still two hand strip, but just slow it down, keep it in the water, keep it in the high percentage zone. And they'll just, they'll come and crush it, man. I mean, it, it could be dead still and, and they'll come and eat it. They don't really care. And because it keeps you connected to the fly all the yes, time. Totally. Yep. You can, you almost always, you get hits when you're not uh, ready to set the hook, even though yeah. pretty hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> stripping when Albie eats is one of the, man, you can't beat it. Yeah. <laughs> you can't wait, it hasn't happened yet, has it? Oh yeah, you got me, but what happened then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you got me. <laughs> Todd, any thoughts on 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 how to manage a really dense bait situation? Yeah, it's been it's been interesting because you know, like last weekend when I found them, they were on probably the top size bait, something small. But yeah. I was running a four inch, one and a half ounce game on, and they were hitting this thing like crazy. Even though the bait was two inches, this bigger bait, you know, run a little bit below the surface at a pretty good pace was getting hit because I, I think it was bigger. It stood out. It looked a little different in that mm -hmm. school of, you know, a million anchovies, you know? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I've got this, uh, wasn't, isn't my original thought, but I really believe that, um, you know, when there's a, when there's a lot going on, a lot of bait, um, there's, you know, when I, you, when you're out at Stellwagen or, or on a bait ball offshore, you're, you, you see um, other species feeding on that same biomass. It's, mm feeds not just the game fish and the bait that's not the whole equation there's other um predators there you know smaller ones i think a snapper bluefish and squid and that i mean if the albie snack doesn't look like squid. a squid quit yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. but exactly. i mean that's the idea is to yeah. match uh or show them something because you now you've accomplished something that stands out but also um uh you know is a is a better meal that that's right in there, you know, in the zone. So that might be yeah. part of what's going on with your bigger uh, game on too. You know, maybe it was looking like a snapper bluefish or something. Yeah, but, but Peter, that's something you put me on to this year because we had so many sand deals around Newport and South County and stripers were just so fussy sometimes. 
and um, slinging the squid flies, man, because there was a squid that were eating the sand eels too. And it was just different enough and just a bit more calories. And I think the same thing is true for the Albies too. It's just such a great idea to have one in your box. The um, And to show, yeah, show them an alternative, you know. Let me see. we got quite a few things in the chat. Let me see if I can't answer some of them. Um, yeah, the other thing, use a casting egg. Yeah, um, we, you know, it's uh, um, uh, tell a quick story. Um, we have a lot of plug builders that come into the saltwater edge and, and they got a great dart or a pencil or this or that. Over, over the 30 years we've been here, there's been a lot. We've seen a lot. And they're like, hey, you know, this thing's great. And, you know, and, and I and I told one of them, this guy, Larry, go home and um, build me a casting egg of the same quality that you do the lures through wired and everything else. And he's done that. And I tell you, we sell, we're to totally sold out right now for the record, but basically yeah. we've sold so many of those over time, far more than we would have sold of anybody's darter or something else. It's ridiculous. But the casting yeah. egg is a solve when you're trying to deliver something like, um, any thoughts on swapping out trebles for inlines on small jigs? I think, um, you know, uh, it's the trebles can be a pain in the ass. And also with a, with Albie, they, they bleed pretty good. So curious yeah. if you guys thoughts or guideline you use when swapping out to uh, swapping out of troubles, any thoughts there? Um, Switch them out as often as I can um, to a single. So a lot of these, a lot of these jigs, whatever come with trebles. And I think that a, you damage the fish a lot and B with the treble, no matter if it's an Albie or a striper, they get more torque on those and it can get kind of just weird in their mouth. So I find that I, I bend more hooks. Uh, I lose more fish. Mm -hmm. If I can get a fish on a single, you know, the catch rate goes up and the release rate, you know, uh, the mortality rate, I would assume goes down. Yeah. Because it's yeah. not damaging fish. When you have, um, you know, like a size one or the two trebles um, that you f typically find on the smaller epoxy jigs, um, what do you swap to? Do you use the Zowire? Do you use the BMC? Do you have any? I use um, the I kind of like go to like a little a uh, little VMC or like a little BKK. I got like on these ones. Uh, this is that new Hoagie um, surface eraser, the four inch. Yep. And it comes with this little. I don't know if it's actually a BKK, but it's a really nice hook, and can't really straighten these things out. They've been awesome, and you get a good hook set on them. So. Yeah, and I like and, uh, I like about that size, you know, yep. for for Albies. I'll switch to a VMC one zero. Is, is fine, you know, inline single one oh, yep, is a good one. And kind then, of match the weight of the treble you took off because you're yeah. not trying to much match the size as match the weight. It doesn't really make a difference, I imagine, on a metal yeah. jig, but with lures, that's the you know, plastic lures, especially where they're light, you're trying not to disrupt the swimming mm -hmm. by dramatically changing the weight, you know, up or down, you know, yeah, don't go with like a super heavy, heavy gauge hook. If you came uh, with a little skinny wire one, you know, yeah, try to try match it. Good stuff. And uh, you know, I'll say with the um, with the with the Albi snacks, yep. those those BKK Titan Rider four O's with the bait keeper, yep. that helps keep that bait up against the top, right on yep. top edge. It's not sliding down on you. So these things came out that, last that, year. This has been a great win. Yeah, that's and nice. The four odd owners uh, that everyone uses, the beasts are going are increasingly hard to get. I mean, yep. we've we order from three or four different locations and they're regularly out, you know, and I just think that the, uh, not a Albies aren't causing it. I think it's just maybe they're not able to produce like they need to, or something, something's amiss with owner and beast at least. So, um, you know, I, and I do, I did find that uh, Titan rider. I think it's called a really nice yeah. book, you know, for all the soft plastics. Yeah. Uh, Yep. So we've covered some stuff about troubles and we covered some stuff about um, how to get distance. Um, so let's move on to next is uh, tactics and retrieves. Let them come to you now. This is a, uh, <clears throat> this is a uh, um, watch hill, but it really illustrates something I believe pretty strongly in about how, um, how to use structure um, and how to, how to, um, you know, basically blind cast. Um, I wrote an article. It's, and on the water this month and i the lead is um you know there's a golf expression called drive for show and putt for dough and i think it's also true with albies everyone loves the busting feed but geez you're going to score better uh working yeah. on structure and letting them come to you 
um, curious what you guys, uh, um, you know, um, Devin, you're kind of obligated for them to come to the structure, yeah, ending on it, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the short guys, we have to be patient. Uh, we, we can't we can't run uh, after the birds that are over the horizon or our friend in the center console call, calling us to come over, you know, so we got to be patient. But I think the boat guys can learn. From yeah, yeah, so so with this structure, for me, um, uh, I used to fish it a lot. Um, you know, there's the buoy out here, and they almost always seem to bust along this early edge. And then they they and they'll fire up all along the um, the reef here. Um, and this is just an example of any reef situation. And this is where all the zigging and zagging and running and gunning happens. But they're using this structure, and then they hit an area like this, and they kind of thin out, and they're still charged up albies and plenty of bait. It's not yeah. as focused, you know. It's not the bait ball that arrived from from over here. It's been hammered and sliced up like a pizza, and plenty of. Yamahas have driven through it too. You know, it's it's a mess, but there's plenty of charged up um, albies and, and uh, more than enough bait. And I've I've had very uh, good uh, fishing over years. Um, more camping in a spot where they might um, where they're generally going to be before they um, maybe uh, leave and get the band back together, as you described, Ray, and, and make another run. You know. Yeah. Have any thoughts on 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 blind casting or letting them come to you? Do you have any? Um, yeah, any I would say that's that's the way to go. Honestly, I mean, you know, the excitement of seeing a feed and and racing over there because you have a throttle in your hand is <laughs> hard, hard to resist sometimes. But um, I catch more fish working an area where I've seen fish, and I mm -hmm. and my clients catch more fish doing that. Um, I'm not gonna like throttle up and throttle down and, you know, create all kinds of noise. And, you know, I would say, I don't know, 75% of the time you race up to a school and as you throttle down, those fish disappear because you're creating way too much noise, way too much disturbance. And whether it freaks them out or not, or they're just in and out of there that fast, whatever. But for me, uh, my confidence is in working an area with bait or an edge where there might be bait and you know, there's fish, seen fish. Mm -hmm. Or your marking fish. The stealth is a big advantage of uh, probably the biggest advantage that anglers have. Period. End. Right. Yep. It, if they don't know you're there, you got a better yeah. uh, to start with. Right. So if you have five boats racing to one pot of fish, good luck. Yeah. You know, if one guy gets tight. Great. Um, but you all could have gotten tight if you just kind of waited and had a little bit more patience. Um, that's why I don't want to fish around twenty other boats because they're going to put fish down. And mm -hmm. I'd just rather find an area with some fish and kind of be a little more patient, like the guys on the wall. And it, like you said, a lot of boat guys could learn from a little bit of patience. The um, so uh, Todd, you know, you you glide around in that kayak. Uh, you're super manu super maneuverable. Um, I remember, uh, you know, you you know, and I I've seen you guys. Uh, basically fling it over your shoulder because you know they're behind you and then you'll go to the task of turning around but uh you know uh i don't think you create as much commotion and noise uh do, is that your observation is that is i mean you know you, are you around feeding fish and they i've seen them pop all around kayaks and you know sometimes certainly around boats but i think the noise thing is is very real yeah i mean look this time of year i always have a rod ready to go um, if I hear something splash behind me, I, I will flip it over my shoulder. You know, you, you can't catch the fish you don't cast that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, just throwing that thing back and then turn yourself and bring it in at, at whatever retrieve makes sense. It's giving you an extra shot. You know, a lot of times this is a, a game of percentages and you, you, you can't hit the shot you don't take, right? And, you know, you just got to get cast out there. And, you know, I, I, last weekend, five of the, I had five fish and three of them I got on the blind, you know? So they're not always going to be breaking. I think you know every cast you don't take is enough as a missed opportunity. Do you do you do you? Uh, it does blind include trolling for you, Todd? I don't troll that much for hardtails. Uh -huh. I really don't. You know, like for me, I'm I'm working structure. I'm working around rocks. I'm working around ridges. I'm working walls, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, you know, th this week out front, the bait's been in tight. It's been just off of the rocks. You know, where it's kind of goes from the break down to like 15, 20 feet. They've been in those areas, you know, so just kind of working some blind casts along there and, and you never know what you'll find. 
I, it's certainly true for me with Albies. We have a joke around here. We call it ABT. Always be trolling. You know, if you're just putting, <laughs> putting around, it's a good idea to yeah. leave, uh, you know, a jig or a, or a Ron Z or a, the fly, um, you know, especially if you're only making small moves. But it's not uncommon to get that thing lit up, you know, in that situation. Just have something in the water all the time. Yeah, but fish are hardest, hardest thing with clients is they see a feed and if the fish aren't up, they won't cast. And I'm like, just throw it. I'm like, throw it, throw it. You know, and it's it's hard. People don't want to throw it if they don't see fish. So the um well good. I think we covered that idea of uh letting them come to you. Um and I think we got a little bit on retrieves already, but you know, there's certainly the steady, whether it's fast or slow. There's the let it settle, um, which is to fall through the bait like a stunned bait fish. I think I've heard that. Um, how about, uh, maybe you spoke a little bit to it, Todd, but um, the burning the jig or keeping it on the surface, you know, skipping it along. I know people do that with, uh, you know, epoxies. Um, any uh, any other, you know, uh, you know what's, what are some of the retrieves you go to when the going is tough? It, it, it's funny. I think when the going is tough, you want it to be making a little bit more action on top. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've seen, I fish Harkers every year too in November, right? So Harkers is a totally different retrieve than up here, you know, um, up That's down awkward. there, down there, your, your tips up and it's really skipping here. You can run a little bit faster, a little bit below the surface, but it's just, you know, I've seen very different retrieves work down there than up here. Um, yeah. it depends. It's, it's, it's a different, it's a very different population of fish down here than down there than up here, you know, um, but that, it, that, that, uh, it's actually the same, um, genus and all that they're just bigger yeah, you know yeah, there's, there's monsters down there and they're they're mostly actively feeding you don't find tough days down there typically oh you know, no you're you them, they're gonna feed they're chewing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah 22 pound albies on on uh on spin and fly pretty 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 good <laughs> but anyway, not down there uh, that's about the biggest i've seen is 22 pounds I know, I know up to 25 with, with Terry Nugent and Riptide, you know, we were trolling, we were trolling bunker 18 miles offshore for Kingfish and a 22 pounder hit it, hit a bunker wow. full size adult bunker on wild on, on wireline. I wow. was, uh, I was offshore two days ago and we're throwing top water plugs for yellowfin and jigging for yellowfin. We got two Albies on big mantis poppers and we got about 20 more on vertical jigs. Um, Two weeks ago, I got one on a big 10 inch Ron Z in 170 feet of water. So they're not afraid to eat big baits. And, you know, whether those offshore and those Harker Island fish are just a little meaner and a little bigger, obviously same fish, but like, I think we just see smaller fish inshore here. Yeah, and I don't know if that's like a, a bait thing or a water temp thing or something, but um, we just don't like, you know, go 40 miles south right now. And there's 20 pound algae there, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, is that, I don't spend enough time offshore, Ray. Uh, is that most years you have that situation or are they, I, I yeah, you see that you see them out there. Um, I would say, you know, a lot this year, but last year there were just as many, Yeah, uh, pretty much the same time of year, you know, they start to kind of filter in and they start mixing with the yellows and, you know, right now pretty much everything's a little mixed out there. You got yellows up higher, big bluefin down deeper and Albies kind of everywhere. So. And we're still not going tomorrow, right? <laughs> I mean, we can make a call at like three. <laughs> to be... what... I want to go. Trust me, I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But uh, so fish fight. the wind, we'll get out there. Yes. Yeah. We'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll find a time next week. Um, fish fighting. You know, just as a uh, um, and I don't know that maybe uh, um, let you guys speak to it, but um, what's the advice you give a client? Um, Ray, when it's, uh, when he's hooked up or, or, um, not to just kind of take it easy, not get overly excited. Don't just start cranking the reel in, um, focus on what the fish is doing and focus on keeping a bend in your rod tip. So, uh, like you have here, shorter strokes, just keeping the rod tip bent and paying attention to where your line is. Cause those fish are going to go this way one second and a second later, they're going to be going that way. So, you know, line awareness, watching it making sure it doesn't go into the boat or into my engines or anything like that. Right. Um, but yeah, just kind of short stroke, staying over the fish if you can. Uh, but just keeping a bend in the rod and staying tight. Sure. That's, the, that's the focus. 
Yeah, from the fly guys that. perspective, Devin, um, you know, it the uh, fly rod's not that good a fish fighting tool. So you gotta yeah. make the what do you um you know imagine it's even a little bit more complicated standing up on a wall um you know on a on a jetty or something. Uh, yeah. Any thoughts there? I mean, I, I, I truly think it, it starts even before you hook the fish. I think proper line management, because getting that thing on the reel is the first challenge and it's gonna happen fast. Um so being consistent with how you're placing your line in your basket and visually looking at how your line is in your basket. Um, if you have any tangles or loops, get them out right away. Um, Cause it's going to make it a lot harder and you're going to pop a rod guide out. If you have a big knot in your, uh, in your fly line when that thing runs. So it starts there and then get to the butt of the rod, man. And the, the top third of the rod is just for casting. Um, so if you're fighting the fish with that, you're going to have a tough time. You really get a low rod angle and get right to the butt, right to the cork. Yep. Okay. Um, Todd, you got the same lifting challenge in a kayak yeah uh, anything to add yeah i think on a kayak the big thing is once you hook up you know obviously if he's running at you you're real as quick as you can to try to get tight again and then you're just managing the steer you know if he wants to go one way you're going to try to go with him you know mm -hmm. keep your keep the tip of your kayak pointed whatever direction they're going um and then just watch the tip you, you know they're going to come back and forth in front of the kayak and that's why i like to have that seven foot rod to be able to keep it around the, the, the front of the 12 foot kayak and not have that line get nipped off by the front. Just, and, 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 you know, um, not a bunch of kayak experience here, but wouldn't you just prefer to um, fight the fish off to the side of the boat and not have the bow to contend with, or is it just the, you end up, you know, pointed at it and that's how it is. It all, it all depends, right? I think a lot of it depends on the wind, the drift, where you are, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, you, you're trying to, you're trying to, obviously you want to land them on your side, but, uh, a lot of times when he's zipping around back and forth, that, that bow is going to come into contention at some point. You just have to be aware of it. Got it. Got it. Um, so, uh, you know, the release, we talked about this early, what we've already learned from the, uh, from the guide association, um, uh, telemetry study, you know, um, this was catch surgery and release. We put in about a, um, double a battery sized uh transponder opened the fish up put it in their belly and closed them up and released them they had water running over their gills in this kind of unique um road pylon road cone thing that they were swishing water with but uh pretty durable fish but would encourage you to get them back in the water as quickly as possible uh certainly and 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 minimize the fight time that's why we want to take a little bit of time to talk about uh fish fighting yeah, I think getting those fish to the boat as, as quick as you can, they're obviously going to live, uh, or I mean, you have more of a chance of them living. Um, minimizing, putting them on the deck of the boat, you know, dropping them, you know, when you're trying to get a picture, hold on tight to that fish because he's, he's going to shake. I don't think a lot of people realize how much they shake, um, but just doing your best to not beat up and bruise that fish and, and bash it around because, you know, they're trying to get back in the water, just hold them by the tail. I kind of like give them a good grab and that, that fork in the tail. I mean, you know, it's kind of the tails on one side of my palm and that, I guess like the peduncle part of the fish there is kind of like right through my, the middle part of my mm -hmm. fingers. Cause then you have a good grip on them, almost like a handle. Um, yeah. It's like a built-in handle. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Great way to land them too. Just grab them I, by the tail. I find when that dorsal fin starts to go, go flat, they're in trouble. You know, if that dorsal fin's sticking up, they're good. If that dorsal fin starts to go flat, that fish yeah. is in trouble. You got to get it in quick. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, Jay Leno's house. Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good spot. <laughs> you're, you're damn right. <laughs> Bot burn, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we all know that one. What's that? We all know that one. <laughs> the, um, uh, so I, I don't see any other questions in the chat, um, but I'd ask you to fire away if you have any. Um, we're going to start to uh, to wrap this up. Um, you know, I want to thank everybody. I want to first thank the panelists, uh, Devin from Decathlon Flies, Todd from Out of Bait, and uh, Captain Ray Jarvis from uh, Salt of the Earth Sport Fishing. Um, I'll send you guys a note tomorrow um, where I will draw the raffle. and. Um, We'll uh, um, give you the contact information, um, anything we've mentioned, Guide Association, Alvi Project, Ray's Business, that kind of stuff. Um, and um, apologize for the slide advance thing. That 
um, you know, I use Zoom a fair amount, but um, haven't done a presentation since it was cold out. And um, um, some part of this setup wasn't quite what I wanted. But um, if there are any questions, um, oh, also thank you to the participants. We had as many as 51 and we have 50. So I think we've delivered some insights and, and content that you guys found compelling or you would have gone to watch I don't know what on TV or something. So um, thank you for hanging out. Um, here's some uh, questions, I believe. Let me just check. Yeah, I just saw that question. Um, yes. You know, identifying hardtails, I would say you're looking more for, for slashes or super aggressive kind of splashes on the surface. Bass tend to be more of like a little pops on the surface and bluefish, a splash, but not as intense as an albi, I would say. So either slashing or... Or up and the hardtail splash is more angled. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because we when they, early on the um, the uh, um, I agree with the 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 uh, Benito slash. That's the one I'm thinking of in particular. Yeah. But the um, um, the bluefish create a lot of false alarms in the in the in the late August time frame. Oh yeah, big <laughs> one, time. He wants and to find albies, you know. And I think uh, some albi feeds can be overlooked because you'll just see them kind of rolling, like almost kind of coming up and just sipping bait, rolling on their side. And it almost looks like a bass rolling on the surface. So yeah, something uh, else to look at. Uh, Ted, I can tell you that um, it wasn't albies, but um, it was, uh, oh, they've popped through the canal here and there to like sandwich, but there was a fair amount of Benito and we may have, it might've, yeah, it was an albi that was caught in the Merrimack uh, River two years ago. Uh, must've been lost you know but we get tarpon in the fish traps here at little compton too so uh who knows right there's th there's a lot going on that we don't know about is what my i would contend so uh quite likely as water's warm they're going to spend more time uh further north you know um you guys kind of covered that uh bass blues blitz thing that was a good answer uh thank you todd um the uh yeah what, what are your thoughts on crushing the barb we also talked about um swapping out the singles, but do you guys crush the barbs in the troubles or just take them off and turn them into singles mostly? Just change them out if I can. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, here we go. Uh, okay. So, uh, what's the teaser? Um, real quick, um, Brendan, what you do is you have an egg, or in Todd's example, you use an epoxy jig to give you the weight um, and uh, pass that and let a light fly get, yeah, there you go, get pulled along behind it, right? So you you um, you put that that uh, dropper behind the, the epoxy, uh, Todd, or in front of it? Put it above it. Above? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you do tie, just tie a um, dropper loop on tag? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've got like a... A set a six foot leader. I do a dropper loop off of it. Put the okay. fly maybe three feet above uh, the epoxy. And the dropper loops the, the the tog fisherman's answer right there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a quick solve. Um, Works great on bass too in the fall. Yeah, yeah. Hey John, I will, what I, I, I will tell you what end, what can end up happening on it. It happened to me last year. Is it? You get hit by two fish and then yeah. it's just blown up, man, right? Man. Two fish hit that. One took the. I ended up bringing in the fish on the teaser and the epoxy was gone. Yeah, it happens. Right? That, that's, it's a good story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, John, if you want to, I'm not sure on your color question. Um, if you want to uh, clarify, um, but uh, yeah, so I um, want to thank uh, everyone for hanging out and um, and. Um, taking it all in um and any questions ask away uh send them uh to uh peter at saltwater edge or something oh yeah there we go so um do you guys have any color preferences on the jigs maybe or the or the alby snacks um you know White mine pink. would be the the brighter you know standout color or standout size when there's a, just a ton of bait but any other thoughts along those lines about color or or uh when white i, I uh, always have silver pink and anchovy I always have those three at a minimum. Yeah. yeah. I go pink, white, and kind of squid anchovy color. Yeah. Yeah. That's same. My go to. Same. Pink, white, pink. tan. Yeah. You know, all those are either the small bait anchovy kind of color or, yeah. um, again, squid. You know, <laughs> that yeah. albie 
looks like a squid and yeah and I, the those, squid color is good those uh alby escorts or alby hordes whatever you want to call them look like a squid and um you know yep. it, uh seems to be the answer in a lot of cases well i want to thank everybody for attending especially the panelists thank you guys for your time and um we'll uh we'll find a way to do another kind of tackle and tactics uh here uh when we have another good topic to talk about, but uh, you guys, everyone online here, enjoy uh, your Albi season. Um, I'll reach out tomorrow with the raffle and some contact info and a link to the uh, got one, a link to uh, the shootout and a link to the Albi project. Thanks a bunch. Okay. Again, thanks, thanks, guys. Care. thanks guys. Have a good night. Bye-bye.